I personally think it's protocol, you see what I'm saying? R.P. Kobe is his birthday today. 2-4 R.P. Kobe, oh, you out there bullying and shit. Happy birthday, my brethren. You know what I signed? It's protocol. We got to do something Kobe related, you see what I'm saying? 2001 Lakers, arguably. I thought it was 2000 Lakers that was amazing. What, like, Shaq was at, was at his peak peak was, what, 2001. I mean, 2000, right? His MVP season. That was arguably the one of the greatest seasons of all time, right? I think, right? If I'm not tweaking. But let's get straight to it. Making the case, 2001 Lakers. Before we get started, make sure you like, comment, and subscribe. For Kobe, man, we got to run this up. We have to. It's his birthday, too. It's his birthday, too. And for Shaq, honestly, bro, I'm feeling it. I'm feeling it. Now, let's do 12 likes. You know what I'm saying? And, hmm. Uh, subscribe, yeah. We recently hit 400 round of applause, you know what I'm saying? New goal is 420. No marijuana, no weed. Dexter, you know what I'm saying? Help me get there. Let's get to it, my brethren. The goal of basketball. To win, right? But not just to win individual games. The ultimate goal is to win a championship. Of course, basketball is a team sport. Championships are won by the most complete, most inspired team. I'm phoning him, I'm phoning him. Every champion deserves credit. But the question on my mind is, who's the greatest team of all time? With apologies to Bill and Wilt, I have a list of eight teams since 1970 that I want to look at as having a claim to that distinction. It is a loaded question, and one that I ultimately can't answer. Is it the teams that were front runners from beginning to end? The ones who were unbeatable at their peak. Maybe the ones who tapped into something special and overcame countless obstacles. There is no right answer. It's your job to make your own call. And it's my job to make the case. So today, I'll be making the case for the 2001 Los Angeles Lakers as the greatest basketball team of all time. Kobe, man. Wayne Crowley, let's make some shit shake. Let's make some shit shake. You do what I sign. Here's what you need to know right away. The Lakers went 56 and 26 in the regular season and 15 and 1 in the playoffs. Wow. They were captained by Shaquille O'Neal and Kobe Bryant, rounded out their roster with several fantastic two way players. Let's see. Let's look. Shaquille, Kobe, Horace, Horace Grant, really? Why? How? So he won what? He won three with the Bulls, and how many with them? Comment down below. When Kobe Bryant rounded out their roster with several fantastic. Did he win three with players, the Bulls? I'm pretty sure. By Phil Jackson. Uh oh. Did you hear that? What? I'm in trouble because that was the sound of a very big red flag going up. What? 56 and 26. That's the record of a pretty good team. Yeah. Not the record of a team in contention for the greatest team of all time. It's the Over era. the last 40 years, excluding lockout seasons, only three other champions won fewer regular season games. We're like two minutes into the video, and Dang. I already have my work cut out for me. What the hell happened, and how on earth is this team even in this conversation? What the hell happened? The short answer is a lack of identity, poor defensive discipline, complacency, injuries, and the most famous power struggle between two teammates in league history. How are they in this conversation? The short answer is because Kobe Bryant and Shaquille O'Neal represent the best, most unguardable, unstoppable, unbeatable one-two combination in the history of the NBA. Just imagine if Kobe Long was answer in is all of that, except, you know, I talk about it more. First, let's frame this team. This Lakers team was smack dab in the middle of what would end up being three consecutive championship seasons, a feat no other franchise has been able to accomplish since. In 2000, the Lakers won 67 regular season games on their way to their first championship since 1988. Shaq was one vote away from being named the first unanimous regular season MVP and added the finals MVP at the end of the year to cap off his ascension to basketball's throne. Kobe, at age 21, was already emerging as one of the premier perimeter players in the game. His well-rounded skill set and approach to the game made him the consensus heir apparent to none other than Michael Jordan. 
He was a critical part of the team's makeup and was already on the fast track to basketball immortality. Following the championship, Shaq took time to rehab and rest his body at Phil Jackson's direction. And in what should come as no surprise to anyone in hindsight, Kobe conversely spent countless hours in the gym honing his skills, determined to fulfill his own goals of hoops supremacy. By the time the team reconvened for training camp, tensions immediately arose between the two superstars and their different approaches to the offseason. Kobe was frustrated seeing Shaq return out of shape after just having had the best season of his career, while Shaq was frustrated with the young shooting guard presuming to be in a position to criticize him following a championship season. And it makes sense from both sides. On the one hand, no. you have Kobe, the patron saint of the perfectionist and determined, someone for whom effort and diligence was second nature. He had just labored all summer because he was coming into his own and was ready to assume the mantle of superstar. Why wouldn't he be frustrated seeing Thanks. someone fail to meet his own tenacious work ethic, let alone his partner in crime? Fuck that. Yeah, bro. Like, not only it, you see what I'm saying? You're able, so, you, uh, uh, so you're coming off of your greatest season of your entire career. Shouldn't that be motivation to get even crazier? Like you, he Shaq literally had a shot at being the greatest of all time. So imagine seeing all of that goddamn that progress or whatever just going down the drain. You see what I mean? Gaining league and finals in On the other hand, imagine the situation from Shaq's perspective. Here's a guy who was seven foot one and three hundred and twenty pounds. Nah, bro, of no speed, excuse. Power, touch, nimbleness, and explosiveness. <clears throat> he was truly an anomaly of human anatomy. He'd been the best and biggest guy on every team he'd ever played on, forged against the Hakeems and the Ewings and the Robinsons. He'd been exerting himself and taking a physical toll for years, and he finally had a ring to show for it. Satisfied. Why wouldn't he take some well-deserved time off? This levels he to this shit. That's my and point. And if you believe Phil, he did what he was told to do. And now he comes back, and this youngster okay. is telling him that he should be working harder? Yes. Throughout the season, these disparate attitudes failed to consistently produce wins on the court. You hear all the time about the alpha dog trope that a pair of great teammates face. From Wilt Chamberlain and Jerry West, to LeBron and Dwayne Wade, to Kevin Durant and Russell Westbrook. These chance pairings always come with the baggage. <laughs> who's the one who's supposed to get the last shot? Whose team is it? And this team took that trope to new levels. Kobe had developed into perhaps the league's most complete player and was eager to prove that he could, and perhaps should, be the player leading the Los Angeles Lakers. At the same time, some of the warts of Kobe's hero ball tendencies came to light as he truly believed that the team was in the best position to succeed when he was the one with the ball in his hand taking the most shots. Kobe. That's also immaturity though. You gotta put that into account. Shaq, of course, resented the fact that coming off the heels of his most successful season, he was already being challenged by his young teammate. The rest of the team, meanwhile, was caught in this maelstrom of egos, unable to find a playstyle or approach that could appease both stars and produce winning results. Even Phil Jackson, who would retire as the most decorated basketball coach to ever live, yes. struggled to amicably settle the dispute. Jackson, long known throughout the league as the Zen master for his philosophical and holistic approach to coaching, couldn't find a way to foster the same synergy that the Lakers had ridden to a championship just months prior. Jackson believed that the success of the team is predicated on the sacrifice of the individual. It's a trite cliche for organizations to talk about a team first philosophy, but it's an idea rooted in truth. To galvanize this team, Kobe would have to accept that despite his tremendous abilities oh as an individual, God. this team couldn't reach its full potential if he took oh, every shot. At the same time, Shaq needed to accept that Kobe was ready to be a more integral part of this team, which would indeed merit him more credit in their victories. As the season continued, this rift only grew deeper. The two were constantly at odds on the court and trading barbs through the media off of it. Through sheer talent, the team was still competitive in most of their games and near the top of the standings, but it seemed to many that they were on a collision course of self-destruction. <clears throat> in fact, it soon became a foregone conclusion to many members of the media that a trade was inevitable, that the feud was irreparable, and that the Lakers were better off cutting bait and acquiring assets for one of their stars. 
you would hear quotes from Bryant saying, turn my game down. I need to turn it up. I've improved. How are you going to bottle me up? I'd be better off playing someplace else. You'd hear Shaq say something like, when everything went through me, the outcome was good. It was 67 to 15, playing with enthusiasm. The city was jumping up and down. We had a parade and everything. It's ego, now bro. But it, and this is why I say it looks so bad for Shaq, though. You see what I'm saying? Because Shaq was way older than him. Shaq was way older than this nigga. He was very seasoned, very, uh, had a very established name within the league, and he's beefing with a 22 year old. That's a bad look, bro. I don't care what nobody say. Even though, yeah, Kobe's a grown, a grown man. But, like, if you're the leader of the team, you're supposed to act like it, bro. You see what I'm saying? You're not. He's seeing bad habits. He's showing you, like, okay, uh, I can take your spot easily, my brother, as the leader. He got mad at that shit. You see what I'm saying? I, I think he's like, I don't know. I don't know. That That's just a bad look, bro. And especially if, if you're claiming to be the leader and yet you're acting like a, a, a high schooler, bro. I don't know. That's that's a bad look to me. And because of this draining situation this, in the locker room. Like I said, it's more so on Shaq. To me, than it is. LA Kobe. simply wouldn't. It was his team, right? Most nights to effectively defend, leading to one of the worst defenses in the league. Shaq also presented a problem with his notoriously poor free throw shooting, shooting just 51% oh from the stripe. Shaq was the major culprit Jesus in making the Lakers Christ. the worst free throw shooting team in the league. On top of it all, Shaq and Kobe combined to miss 22 games. Ron Harper missed substantial time due to knee injury, and perhaps most. They had Ron Harper too. Derek Fisher missed the first what? 62 games of the season with a broken foot. Derek Fisher, the Ron team's backup Harper? point guard who hadn't started a single playoff game the year prior, returned to the court on March 13th, and with him brought the fire back to Los Angeles. Instantly inserted into the starting lineup, Fisher came back with a hot hand, which helped space the floor for other shooters, and most mm. importantly for Shaq. He brought a new defensive energy that would eventually encourage the team and shore up their biggest weakness. And most importantly, he brought stability. By the time he retired, Derek Fisher had set the record for most playoff games played in an NBA career. Seriously. What's more, Derek Fisher was never the most important player or top Ever. scorer on any of those teams. But he was a key That's just piece. not what he brought to the table. But it's no mistake that he found himself on so many playoff yeah. teams in so many playoff games. Teams were, almost without exception, better with Derek Fisher on the roster. Yeah. He got, he what, five championships? The game that went beyond makes and misses. When and how to feed Shaq. When and why to let Kobe operate. And when and how to get the ball to the rest of the Lakers the and make this group of talented players a team. In the 20 regular season games that Fisher played, the Lakers went 15-5 and five and finished the regular season with an eight-game win streak, their longest all season. And in this late season confluence of events, the final piece fell into place. As Fisher returned from injury, Kobe fell victim to it. He missed 11 of the team's last 21 games. And in those games, the Lakers went 8-3. and three. During that time on the bench, Kobe saw the success that the team was having without him, one of the best players in all of basketball. With Fisher at the helm, the Lakers flowed on offense and seemed energized on defense. You wouldn't say that they were better without Kobe, but they were playing their best basketball of the season without it's him. It's a bad look, not gonna if lie. If I had to guess, I would venture to say that at some point, Maybe not overtly, uh. maybe not all at once, but at some point, Kobe and Shaq decided to meet each other halfway. By now, it was clear that the worst thing about the team was the relationship between these two. Now we're 23 and 11. We figured out. But it was also obvious that the best thing about this team was these two. Remember this? That's one of the most Somehow, iconic they moments. Struck some kind of a chord. Kobe would take a small step back but Shaq would concede some of the spotlight. Kobe didn't resign to be Robin. Instead, he would be the Batman to Shaq's Superman. I told mm. you. See what I'm saying? Story. Nah, that, that, he said Somehow, that Somehow, despite bro. their underwhelming record and their foibles and their squabbling, they were better. They'd evolved. Shaq had played himself into shape and was bringing the pain every night. 
Kobe had improved in nearly every aspect of his game. They had the swagger of a winner and the confidence of a champion. They were better than everybody by a ludicrous margin. In all of their playoff games in the Western Conference, they did not lose. Not one game. Three straight sweeps. 11 straight wins to go back to the finals. That's crazy. The combination of Shaq and Kobe was apocryphal for other teams. Who? In what that mean? games against the Kings, Shaq put up 44 and 43 points to take a 2-0 lead. Wow. Kobe then took center stage and put up 36 and 48 points to put Sacramento on ice. Crazy. And that's the way it went throughout the playoffs. Let me see. To what? 48 and 16? Wow. 36, 7, and 4. Sacramento on ice. That's crazy. And that's the way it went throughout the Let me points see. to take... 44, 21, and 4. 43, 20, and 2. Nah, that's, that's, that's crazy. Kobe then lie. took center stage and put up 36 and 48 points to put Sacramento on ice. And that's the way it went throughout the playoffs. They beat the Spurs, who had home court and the best record in the league, by 14, 7, uh. 39, and 29 points, respectively. 39? It was an absolute thrashing. Kobe had his best series thus far and helped send the Lakers to their second consecutive finals. Chick Hearn, the quintessential Lakers play-by-play -play broadcaster ah, since 1961, a... who coined terms like slam dunk, air ball, and triple double, said this. There's no team in Laker history ever played at a higher level of perfection than this team is doing. And that's a huge compliment, Matched bro. up against league MVP Allen Iverson's Philadelphia 76ers in the finals, the Lakers stumbled for their mm. first and only time thanks to Iverson's heroic performance in game one. Yeah, the Lakers like 48? responded with four consecutive wins to capture their second title in as many years. It wasn't a super dramatic conclusion. Even though some of the games were close, it ended up being a five game series. But sometimes being the best isn't about the dramatic seven game thrillers or the narrow victories. That's so sometimes tough. it's just about kicking ass. Yeah. And the Lakers kicked some ass. And it's not like the, these were difficult teams. I mean, it's not like uh, the teams they went through were just cakewalk. Like, I'm pretty sure it was static. You see what I'm saying? They were just that good. 15-1 and one through the playoffs. They were just as close that to nice, a clean sweep bro. As any team has ever gotten. They faced stiff competition, yeah. becoming just the second team in history to defeat four straight 50-win teams. See what I'm saying? And they posted the highest net rating of any postseason team ever. How? Because they had Kobe Bryant and Shaquille O'Neal yep. playing together at the same time on the same team. Every time, every time, every single time it was time for them to lock in. And Shaq said this too. Every time it was time for them to lock in, they locked in. I feel like I've talked enough about what it meant to have 2001 Shaq. With a 7-7 wingspan, he was the most physically dominant player to ever step onto a basketball court outside of a Wilt Chamberlain. The guy literally changed the way they make NBA baskets. In the finals against Dikembe Mutombo, who had just won his fourth Defensive Player of the Year award, Shaq put up the spectacular stat line of 33 points, 15.8 rebounds, oh 4.8 assists, and 3.4 blocks en route to his second straight finals MVP award. He had soft touch on his jump hooks, underrated abilities as a pack, 4.8 assists, and 3.4 blocks en route to his second straight finals MVP award. He had soft touch on his jump hooks, underrated abilities as a passer, the explosiveness to go over any defender, and the maneuverability to get around any player his size. And I heard that he is one of the greatest big uh, or pass, passers as a center. He's one of the greatest, how do you even phrase that? Center passers? Passers at the center position? Yeah, that's what. He's one of the best passers at the center position of all time, if I'm not tripping. I'm pretty sure Wilt is the greatest, and then it's him. Comment down below. I could be wrong. Nah, it's, it's Jokic. Then Will. Yes, it's Jokic. 100%. Come on now. It's Jokic, 
Will and then him probably. I don't know too much about his passing game though. I'm being honest. Defensively, he wasn't Bill Russell or Hakeem Olajuwon, Ugh. but he was good enough to be a second team all defensive selection and loomed as one of basketball's most intimidating Jesus forces in the paint. Right. He was the linchpin to this Lakers dynasty. Since its inception in 1969, two players have won three consecutive finals MVP awards. One is Michael Jordan. The other is Shaquille O'Neal. That's crazy. Few players he in this three. game's history have come close to matching the level of peak Shaquille O'Neal. Think you can stop him? Well, then have fun guarding Kobe Bryant. Yeah, exactly, You know, man. the closest thing to Michael Jordan that there's ever been. Yeah. In 2001, Kobe hadn't yet extended his range effectively beyond the three-point arc, but he was still one of the best shot makers in the business. He had flawless body control, the ability to shower you with an array of shots from damn near anywhere, a ceaseless motor on both ends of the court, and world-class athleticism. Mm. What? He was scintillating in the playoffs and averaged 29, mm. 7, and 6, leading the Lakers in postseason passing. So, can you stop Shaq? Can you stop Kobe? Can you stop them both? Fuck no. Probably not. But even if you can, you now have to contend with a Others. fantasy roster full of two-way beasts. You've got Derek Fisher, a double-digit scorer, offensive maestro, and defensive pest. Rick Fox, who also averaged in the double digits, shot 39% from three in the regular season, and who was capable of locking down top scorers like Peja Stojakovic. Plus, top-shelf playoff veterans like Ron, Ron Harper, Harper, Horace Grant, Brian Shaw, Ori. and the X Factor of every team he's ever been on, Robert Ori. Ugh. With those players, could the Lakers have played today? With a couple of tweaks, absolutely. If the three-point shot rules the day, they can keep up. In the playoffs, the Lakers shot the exact same percentage for wow. the 2017 Warriors. Wow. They have the perfect swingman to switch on defense and enough star power to compete with any Dang. team that's come since. I mean, man, wouldn't you love to see a team try to play small ball against Shaq? Oh I mean, it's really that. Simple. But, 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 but personally, that would be a war because it'll be, it'll be. I mean, they shit. They said that they were, but who took more? You see what I'm saying? Who took more and who made more? So it could be a similar uh, percentage, but did they take the exact same amount? You see what I'm saying? Personally, I think Warriors would just because. Bro, Curry, KD, yeah, they would get torched in the paint though. But like two is three is more than two. It would just kill them on the perimeter, bro. Kill them. And, and Warrior and Warriors ball movement is fucking phenomenal. But I, I don't know too much about this this Lakers organization, so who knows? Stop Shaq. And we'll even never if know you though. Could, how many other teams in history can tote out Ellie. another first ballot? First teamer, all timer, two way dynamo hey. in their athletic prime uh. as the sidekick. They're the best one two punch to ever play yes, on the same far. team at the same time. So, let's say you focus all your attention and energy, neutralizing the two of them. Can you stop all of those role players? Fuck no. And do you think you can do it all while out coaching Phil Jackson? Pick your poison. It doesn't matter what you decide. You're not making it out of there alive. Yeah. They weren't the best start to finish team ever. If that's your thing, your 1972 Dolphins jersey is in the mail. But when they were at their best, when it came time to win with stakes on the table, you could not beat this team. They were too good at too many things from top to bottom. Other pairings won more championships together. Other teammates dominated their eras for longer periods of time. But I maintain that no two teammates, as an overall pairing of destructive forces at both ends of the court, were better than Shaquille O'Neal and Kobe Bryant in the playoffs of 2001. The Venn diagram of these two talents overlapped in a way and on a level that has no equal. And that's the enduring legacy of this Lakers team. The yin and yang of conflict and victory. You're gonna get the squabbling and the feuding and the power struggle. Yeah. It had man, all that shit always happens, bro. Like they just don't publicize it. Publicize, yeah, that's the word. 
They just don't, you see what I'm saying? Um, this shit always happens, bro. They just, Shaq did a little, he just, the, his approach was very immature. But, like, shit like this always happens. I, I wouldn't even be surprised if niggas during practice was fighting all the time. Like, scrapping 30s. You see what I'm saying? All the time. I wouldn't be surprised. I'm being honest. Byproduct That's just the environment. And of how different these two men were. This can't be soft so many to levels. It. But they realized time and time again that theirs was an unstoppable partnership. They put the pettiness aside, bought One. into the team and to each other, and won over and over and over again. They didn't win seven championships together. Instead, they ushered in a new Lakers dynasty, the most unstoppable duo ever, and in 2001, the greatest basketball team of all time. Uh, very good argument, very good argument. And they, they said they went against all 50 teams. Like I said, bro, I really do be knowing my shit. I really do be knowing my shit. Dexter, once again, shout out Clay, uh, Clayton Crowley. Um, he didn't really put nothing into perspective. He was just kind of validating what I already knew. Because <laughs> I'm a fucking genius. See what I'm saying? But nah, for real though. I know that these niggas were elite. And they were able to get... They were able to get three rings, but just put that into perspective, bro. I, in five years, they were able to get three rings and four finals appearances on bad terms. So just imagine if these niggas were able to get their shit together before they even got championships. Just get their shit together, lock in, man. But like that would low key hurt. Nah, Kobe would most likely if. Comment down below. Do you think Kobe in that dynasty, um, uh, in that dynasty, I'm talking about if they were able to, like, click, get shit together, Shaq stayed, you see what I'm saying? Comment down below. Do you think Kobe would be able to get a finals MVP? If so, I think he his, his legacy definitely would be different. It will probably be, like, instead of second all the time, he'll probably be, like, top 15, Probably close to top ten, but uh, yeah, his his legacy would be different. However, Shaq's, if he was able to get all uh, Finals MVPs for for them rings, if he stayed, man, he'll be the greatest of all time, and I stand on that. But that's about it.